Hi everyone, this is Laura Smith and Carrie Ebert. Um, and we are here today very excited because on our social media, we get a lot of questions about dysarthria um, because both of our specialty, we, as many of you know, we specialize in childhood apraxic speech, but dysarthria is another um, concomitant condition that can occur with apraxia and it's another motor speech disorder. And a lot of people um, have a lot of questions about it. And it was so funny because Carrie and I were talking one day about how we wish we could find someone or get this information out to people from someone who kind of has more of a specialty in dysarthria. And literally the ASHA leader publishes something on Facebook and I tag Carrie in it. So Dr. Levy, welcome. Yes, thank you for being here. Thank if you, you could just tell us a little bit about your, or Carrie, um, well, let's have Dr. Levy go. If you could just tell us a little bit about yourself. Be happy to. So thank you for inviting me. I agree it's an important area and I'm always happy to speak to people who specialize in motor speech disorders and to the general clinicians out there and parents because you're right, so much information is needed on dysarthria and apraxia. So I'm really glad about what you're doing as well. So I am here at Teachers College, Columbia University and um, I, my specialty area is dysarthria, uh, both in children and adults. We'll focus on children here, but I look at um, motor speech disorder, specifically dysarthria across um, languages. So, um, wow. and also across the age span. So I look at Parkinson's disease and treatment for it um, in Mandarin speakers, English speakers, Spanish speakers, and our research on children with dysarthria, and all of this is with my doctoral student and master's students, um, my research on children with dysarthria focuses primarily on English speakers. The, most of the work that I've done, uh, English speakers with dysarthria due to cerebral palsy. But my um, doctoral students are also looking at Korean speakers uh, with cerebral palsy. And we've also done a randomized control trial in Belgium on French speakers with cerebral palsy. I'm a native speaker of French, German, and English. So, wow. <laughs> are you I a rock know. star? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, one can be dysarthric in many languages, so we really want to be able to help people across languages. Um, so we have, we've had speech camps in um, here at Teachers College and as well in Belgium uh, for children, French and English speaking children with dysarthria. And um, we'll be talking more about treatment, I'm sure, but I actually have my Hawaiian lion, think of the vowel space, Hawaiian lion, big vowel space, and he has a big mouth and a strong <laughs> voice. So we do treatment involving big mouth and strong voice called speech intelligibility treatment. Wow, There's, I love that. Yeah, What's his name again? Hawaiian lion? Yeah, we have a whole song on, about him. <laughs> oh, his little lion. I'm writing that down. <laughs> I know, I'm like, oh, I gotta get that. Gotta get me a Hawaiian <laughs> lion. Absolutely. <laughs> this little one has doesn't have a big mouth or a strong voice and it's very hard to understand him, right? Because he doesn't have a big mouth. And a strong voice. I love so, the visuals, Dr. Levy. That is beautiful. Oh, we really I'm in love. That. So um, this is what we do. We test treatments um, and also we do stimulability where we try different methods and see what makes kids sound more intelligible. So my goal is to make, help children become more intelligible across languages. That is so awesome. Wow. I love it. <laughs> yeah. I've already learned so much. I love it. I just am fascinated <laughs> since uh, Laura and I are both uh, pediatric SLPs and I actually specialize in the birth to three population. Uh, Laura, I think, do you work with kids of all ages or? Well, I mean, I do have someone with uh, cerebral palsy right now who's, you know, has just kind of transitioned from teenhood to early adult. So he's like, you know, 19, 20. Uh -huh. um, but for the most part, my practice is like three to eight, I would say is the majority. Very good. So we've kind of covered all of pediatrics between, you know, the, the populations that we serve. And I think that sometimes with dysarthria, there's this idea, or let's just say with motor speech disorders in general, there's this idea that we need to fix their speech. And so much of what we need to do is make them more intelligible, you know, is give them a way to functionally communicate. And so I love that you said that was your main goal is to, you know, increase speech intelligibility with that. What was it? Big mouth, big voice. You know, I just that big mouth and strong voice strong voice see I got to get it right big mouth big strong, mouth strong voice strong I love it. Voice. I know I'm taking Florida. notes on my phone <laughs> yes <laughs> love it love it yes yeah, so I agree about intelligibility that is my focus and I think 
we may never get to the point with some some of the children to have accurate or normal or typical sounding speech. Mm -hmm. um, I would say in general, when you have children with um, motor speech disorder, sometimes they can be so severe that children need to use uh, AAC, augmentative right. punitive communication. Whatever works to get the communication across is okay. So that's the, the highest level, I guess. Right. Uh, and then and if, if hopefully through uh, maybe a little bit lower level than that of, of help needed would be comprehensibility with intelligibility that is a mixture maybe of AAC or hand you know signing or eye contact um, with with the speech um, and then you get to if somebody can just function with speech that's great try to make the speech itself intelligible and that's where we focus um, but and then once they're they're strong enough to be once they're intelligible enough then you can work on on um accuracy, intelligible, uh, sorry, accuracy and naturalness. And actually, Rupal Patel has shown that as people get more natural sounding, they become more intelligible as well. So there are many layers at which you can work, many levels at which you can work. Uh, but intelligibility, I think, is really key for this population. And I love, because what you're really starting to talk about then is those prosodic features, you know, the supra segmentals of speech that we know um, with our kiddos with apraxia, they often end up having that choppy staccato sounding speech because they have difficulty with those movements between sounds and syllables. And so I, I agree that prosody or, you know, that normal natural flow is always going to increase intelligibility. Um, Dr. Levy, the one thing you said that I just love is when you were talking about, you know, start with uh, communication, AAC, if that's what's needed. One thing that I always try to talk about is language and then speech, right? We're speech language pathologists, but let's start with language. Make sure kids have a way to communicate and then we can address, you know, those speech issues. Right. So. And you have to have something to shape, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, exactly. You gotta have the words to shape them. We don't want to get sounds before we get the words. It's not going to work that way. So yeah, communication, big picture is really key. It really yeah, is. Yeah, I'd like to drive that message home too, just for a lot of parents that I get come into my office and they are adverse to having AAC or they don't, you know, once they find me seemingly a praxia expert, then they just want to like put the device to the side. And I'm like, okay, listen, what they're doing on the device in this easier format that they're able to formulate and produce language and communication is what you can expect me to get if and when we can break through their speech motor planning system. So I have to have a base. I have to know that there's a language base there um, or otherwise like you said working on the sounds is just working on sounds without any uh, background knowledge or information so yeah and absolutely communication breeds communication the more yeah. they communicate the more they're willing and the more successful they'll be Absolutely. Absolutely. And you guys, I mean, how much could we talk about the importance of success? Because so many of our children with motor speech disorders, they anticipate failure. Why? Because everything they've tried to do with their voice has resulted in, in failure. So these kids end up not being communication risk takers. They don't try to open their mouth and turn their motor on. So we have to find a way to make communication successful, a positive experience so that we can turn them into communication risk takers. And so that's why that language piece is so absolutely essential. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and um, I think research is also beginning to go in that direction as well. So I was very excited about intelligibility and research going in that direction. But over time, I realized, you know, communicative participation is so mm. important, getting kids to communicate and want to communicate and initiate communication more. And a lot of the research at the recent motor speech conference was really about that. And, and our studies have also shown increased communication um, when people are able to be more intelligible. That's got to be a key um, goal as well, because we want kids to just communicate. More absolutely, than. absolutely. So I know that you said that um, your specialty is more, a set, or sorry, treatment. And that's what I read in the ASHA leader was just, if you guys haven't checked it out, it was, I think, um, just this earlier this year, um, it was published and then they reran it again here in February. But um, Dr. Levy does have an article and it did talk a lot about um, therapy activities, functional activities, fun activities to do in therapy. Um, so I know that's your specialty, but we do get a lot of questions on assessment. Um, and so just, you know, maybe briefly, what is out there and what, where can people go? I mean, yeah, if you could speak so to that. There are the more formal assessments out there. I think I've written down um, like the Frenchet, the Kauf Kaufman, Nuffield, um, the SAR-3 examination, battery, dynamic evaluation of motor speech skills. So a lot of the apraxia and um, 
did Sartria evaluations actually over, overlap because we're trying to differentially diagnose praxia, dysarthria, and phonological speech sound delay disorder. Um, but the truth is that the real gold standard uh, way of measuring, um, of assessing speech sound, uh, sorry, motor speech disorders and specifically dysarthria is perceptual measurement. So perceptual assessment, the eyes, our eyes and ears, eyes and ears are really key. So, you know, we could, if, if our particular state um, or area requires certain uh, standardized tests, you know, use them as needed. But the fact is that we are going to rely on our senses to determine whether a child has praxia, dysarthria, and phon or phonological disorder, or a mixture of all of those. Um, so I think you would agree <laughs> that. Yeah, right. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Right. I have a quick question. Do you yeah. think it's important in assessment to look at familiar listeners versus uh, non-familiar listeners? Does that hold a big, or does it not really matter in, in, in the grand scheme of things? I think it's important. It gives information about um, true intelligibility, for mm -hmm. example. Um, parents, for example, know what their kids are going to say before they actually say it. Um, and teachers also begin to, to, uh, understand kids. And we know even when we watch a movie, for example, from the beginning to the end of the movie, you know, at first we hear somebody with such an accent or some speech that's unusual to us and we can't understand a thing. And by the end, we're practically speaking like the person and we understand <laughs> everything because there's an adjustment period where we uh, adjust to their vowel space and, and mm -hmm. to their speech. So I think it is important to know how somebody actually hears a child and perceives a child when they first speak to them. Because when we first meet somebody, that's a very important moment and uh, we need to be understood. So that's, I think, important, but at the same time, they're with people they know a lot. So how is their communication in their daily life? Great. So I think both, both Thank pieces you. of information are important. When you're diagnosing uh, or looking at assessment for dysarthria, what place does the maximum phonation times have or like those SZ ratios, things we normally use with adults? Do you feel like they could transfer to children? I do have children um, usually say ah for as loud and as long as they can. Um, and a lot of people do that kind of thing because yeah. it gives information about um, voice quality. So if you hear a lot of harshness, for example, or if they can't sustain their maximum phonation for very long, you know, do they have poor breath support? Um, is, there, is their speech, is their voice breathy? You know, are the vocal folds not coming together? so well. So I think it does give good information. I don't go crazy with it. I don't do too much of it. Um, if they sound pretty monotone, I, I want to know, can they, can they go, ah, ah, and they have no problem doing this. I mean, three-year-olds don't mind. Yeah. <laughs> So. And let's say I have apraxia too. And, yeah. you know, I don't know if we have any numbers. Uh, Laura, have, are you curious? You know, we know they can uh, co-occur apraxia and dysarthria. Dr. Levy, do we have any numbers to know how often that might happen? I don't think we have any numbers. If there are any, I'm not familiar with them because it's even hard to get a number for dysarthria. Right, um, right. Yeah. It's also such a range, you know, there's some people who just are a little bit breathy or a little bit strained mm -hmm. vocal quality. Um, and there are some who are perfectly intelligible but have characteristics of dysarthria. Um, and then there's some who can't speak, you know, who use AAC. Yeah. So, sure. uh, so it, it's, it's, the numbers are difficult, but there's definitely co-occurrence. And um, the, the number one uh, motor disorder in children is cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. And so a big caseload is often, uh, a big chunk of our caseload is often children with cerebral palsy and they can have dysarthria uh, or apraxia or both. Do all children with CP have dysarthria? Great question. No. No, so, they don't. Okay. No. Some children with CP don't have dysarthria. Um, there are some who are and so um, dysarthric that they uh, they need AAC, and then there's some in between. But um, actually, Dr. Hustad and Allison, um, Dr. Allison, have found that even for those who are not necessarily considered having dysarthria, they're not often not quite typical. At least oh, some okay. of them. So you know, there's really I think a whole spectrum. What there. about Down syndrome? I always think of children with Down syndrome as having dysarthria. Is that across the board, or is are there children with Down syndrome who don't have dysarthria? Down syndrome is the most complicated <laughs> disorder. It's, I love working with kids with Down syndrome um, in general, but they have a lot going against them. And I think it's really hard to categorize what, what they have exactly. So mm -hmm. 
people will often say they have a motor component. You know, some are hesitant to say that they have apraxia, but there's definitely motor pr- planning. Mm-hmm. Um, and some are hesitant to say they have dysarthria, but there's often, you know, a strained vocal quality. Um, and so I would say that there's a motor problem. Often there's an execution problem along with the structural uh, mm-hmm. difficulties children with um, Down syndrome have, you know, and yeah, um, as well as cognitive and then the hearing <laughs> that often goes with it. So it's really remarkable that children with Down syndrome are actually often able to speak and their communicative intent, this is what mm-hmm. we were talking about earlier, is so strong yeah. often that, you know, they want to play house, they want to play with a lion, they, um, and they can really make amazing progress. Yeah, I feel they, like that's the the research just isn't there yet. It's like the same with autism. Like I can read one research article from a reputable source that says autism and apraxia co-occur. And I can have other people who are experts in um, apraxia who say, oh no, you know, that's like its own separate thing, apraxia and autism. But um, Carrie has a son (laughs) with both. Um, So we know that certainly it does occur, but I just feel like the research isn't as, um, we don't have the breadth of the research yet there for these other disorders with the motor speech disorders. It's very difficult research. uh, And we need to, when I was in grad school, you know, my motor speech disorders class, which I think every speech language pathology student probably still takes, it was all about adults. I mean, we didn't really even cover any motor speech disorders in children per se. I think they touched on dysarthria in children, but I don't remember ever learning anything about apraxia in children. And so uh, for uh, me, it has been quite, uh, I graduated in 1995 with my master's. So, I mean, it has been quite a journey to become a specialist in apraxia, you know, because of all the continuing education we've had to take and, you know, just really delving into to it and trying to really figure out what the, 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 the core deficits are and then find ways to treat those. Yeah, I agree. And if we think about the famous motor speech disorders books, um, <laughs> mostly about, about adults. And, right. Uh, in our course, I, I teach it uh, neuropathology of speech. We do go over children and adults. And we also talk about different languages. That's another fascinating, <laughs> often, often missing. So yeah, um, we try to cover that here too. That leads us into our next, my next question, actually, which was Carrie just touched on it, like the journey to learning about or becoming an expert in apraxia is, um, you know, quite the journey because it's all postgraduate education. And so, you know, this is my question and both of our question on dysarthria. Um, what training or courses would you recommend? What's out there for SLPs looking to get more knowledge in this, if any? Right. So, um, are you thinking dysarthria in general or, or um, treatment? I mean, either. Yeah, <laughs> dysarthria <laughs> assessment and treatment in <laughs> pediatric dysarthria. Yeah, that's yeah. what we're looking for. <laughs> yeah. the, the answer is, is quite similar. It's, there's not that much out there. Um, but at ASHA, there are trainings and there's, um, there's a motor speech um, program often. And I'm always part of it. have been part of that lately um, where there are um, a lot of presentations on it. So I would definitely look for that um, There's for children and for adults. But as you said, I mean, there's still very limited specifically clinical training um, for SLPs. So um, the ones that come to mind, and it, it's all really about the treatment because I, um, I, mean, there, I think Edith Strand, for example, does a lot of uh, trainings and um, just has a lot of great research that's very clinically um, applicable out there. So I trust everything she does. Yeah. I love her. Yeah. yeah so, the best. So <laughs> that, you know, the, the, I think that the, the main thing is the differential diagnosis and mm-hmm. she and Macaulay and i um, trying to think actually in the same um, issue of ASHA leader, I'm looking, there was um, Clark and Bass who had apraxia versus um, phonological disorders and Edith Strand again, you know, has, um, has a lot of research that for the differential diagnosis. So there's, I think that's the main part that we need for the assessment piece. Um, For the treatment, again, there's there's less out there. Um, So maybe it makes sense for me to tell you a little bit about the treatments that are out there. um, And then we can- talk be, about where to find before you person. before you do that dr levy could you just give us a few of what those perceptual features are in children with dysarthria if you could just give us that doesn't have to be a complete list but just some of the things that we should be listening for sure so um 
I think I have a definition here um, that dysarthria is really a group of motor speech disorders. So mm -hmm. it's not one particular thing at all. And it occurs at one or more, usually more of the subsystems of speech. Um, so, and the characteristics really depend on the type of dysarthria, although type of dysarthria in children is less relevant in my okay. opinion than in adults, especially since we don't really have many treatment implications. Um, so um, slow speech, variable vocal intensity, or it can be, uh, yeah, vocal intensity can be very, very quiet. And that's an important thing I wanna talk about a little bit more, um, or it can be very variable. Um, it can, um, slow speech, variable vocal intensity, monotone, um, imprecise articulation is a key one, um, but it really depends on the child and the particular lesions uh, at what's the, the neural subsystems that are affected in the particular child. So um, for example, I think, you know, Murray et al's study has found that the you know, main ways to differentially diagnose apraxia, childhood apraxia of speech and dysarthria is the oral motor assessment, motor speech eval, um, and specifically multisyllabic words. Um, so multisyllabic word production is usually not that affected in dysarthria. I mean, sure, as something gets a, a sentence in, in, yeah, in dysarthria, as the sentence gets longer, of course, you run out of breath stream, but it's not this complete breakdown that mm -hmm. often happens in childhood apraxia of speech. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, if I maybe this is a good time for me to play sound clips um, so that we can hear those. And I'm also going to plug my computer in. Hold on one second. There we go. <laughs> that is very good. OK, so let me share my screen. And this way we can hear a little bit. Um, so let me first play this one here. Don't put any water. I'll play it again. So we hear a, vo a harsh voice quality, some articulatory imprecision. Don't put any water. And monotone, right? So this, this child has spastic uh, CP and dysarthria. Um, I want to play a boy, uh, another boy who has dysarthria. And, okay. He's going to repeat a, a clinician. So sh she's going to say something and he'll repeat what she says. The blue spot is on the key. Blue spot in the key. My Bobby a puppy. My Bobby a power. Okay. And I hear, you know, we're all straining to hear a little bit. So a key feature of dysarthria often is that quiet voice. Um, and I have um, worked with Professor Lori Ramig, you know, who does Lee Silverman voice treatment, which um, yeah. focuses on louder speech. And so this is that is also one um, treatment that's used for children with dysarthria. It focuses on healthy vocal loudness. So you can hear here that no matter how clear your articulation is, if you don't speak loud enough, if you speak like my little this one, nobody's going to understand you. So healthy vocal loudness is really important and that's often missing in dysarthria not always but often it is it's it's often there are many children who are who are quiet okay here's another clip of the same boy get some more cheese get some more cheese break the chocolate bar break the chocolate bar so again it's monotone you hear the articulatory issues you heard some drooling actually in the first one um and poor bilabial closure. Um, and what happened in between here was our treatment. So you can actually see in the sound wave that um, he becomes louder. Um, wow, there's a big that's difference. so fascinating. Yeah. So this is without any cueing, you know, we didn't say speak louder or anything. We just tested him pre-treatment, tested him post-treatment. And, you know, he sounds clearer. He sounds more yeah. um, intelligible and so. We, we reached our goal with him, but he'll still sound dysarthric. So getting back to our point earlier, you know, he, you know, I hope that he sounds more and more typical. My guess is that he'll always have dysarthria, but hopefully he'll be more intelligible, increasingly intelligible as he gets older and, you know, continues to get treatment. Um, 
And then, so, so you heard some of those speech characteristics, monotone, articulatory difficulties, um, low vocal volume. Here is a girl who has CP and cerebral palsy, dysarthria and apraxia. So we can listen to this. Can you say, oh, oh. Okay, so you hear that strain, all oh, hear that strain. She gets very loud, so I actually turned down um, <laughs> the volume and it's, it's a little clipped sounding, but it'll get the point across. A, A, E, E. She's doing well with the vowels, right? I, I, excellent. How about me? Me. My. My. Hi. Hi. Up. Up. On. All. Mom. Mom. Okay, so once we got to a two syllable, she yeah. can falls apart. Yeah. Good, Good job. Base. Yes. Baseball. Hey, ball. Good job. Baseball player. Boy, boy. Boy, Carrie, that's what we see all the time. <laughs> wow. No, no, well, you can tell right away. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. So she has dysarthria, but primary, I would say, work on the childhood apraxia of speech first. Right. Because before we, you know, she doesn't need amplification, but <laughs> we to, to work on, you know, that big mouth, let's say, we mm -hmm. got to get the big mouth saying more accurate speech sounds. Absolutely. Fascinating. Hey, I was just thinking, can... Can dysarthria, it can't ever just be a standalone diagnosis, right? I mean, is there always going to be a primary diagnosis and then, you know, like CP or Down syndrome and then, or, or can dysarthria, can dysarthric speech occur without another diagnosis? That's a very interesting question. Um, I would say that it, it does happen a lot that I get calls, I get emails saying this person doesn't have a diagnosis of anything, but they have dysarthria. It's clear they have dysarthria. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, they don't have that. They should have a diagnosis. And typically, these are, for example, children who are kind of clumsy, uh, low tone, something a little bit off, um, and they clearly have dysarthria. So I think they should have a diagnosis. I think something is not typical. Something is atypical motor in their motor system. Could it be um, developmental coordination? I was just thinking that. The, yeah, that's exactly what I was I thinking. Just, I feel like we're missing a whole subset of kids who walk late, they're clumsy, Me they too. do terrible in sports, they never learn to ride a bike like my son. Um, you know, they, they're missing all of these things, but because they can walk and run and jump for the most part, they can climb playground equipment, they never qualify for physical therapy. But I don't know, I feel like this developmental coordination disorder is something that is prevalent, but going undiagnosed. And perhaps some of these kids end up having a comorbid dysarthria with that developmental coordination disorder. Right. And if it's dysarthria, it may not be coordination alone. Okay. It's more of an execution problem. Mm -hmm. So the muscles aren't strong right. or, or something like that. So oh, I don't Right. Know. Like if you have is hypotonia. Mild... Yeah. What is that then? Hypotonia? What would the diagnosis be? I, I don't know. But I think the other thing that happens is... Um, <laughs> that neurologists um, are hesitant to oh, give. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of children have cerebral palsy who, I don't know, I am not a neurologist. Like a mild, they, a mild yeah, CP. They sure look like the many, many children with CP that I've worked with, but for some reason, the neurologist is not giving them that diagnosis. Okay. And, you know, Let me tell you a story on that real quick. Yeah. So oh, yeah. I know we, great we, <laughs> <laughs> um, I know you're not as familiar. We just kind of met with me. But my daughter has um, a genetic mutation that caused apraxia. That's the first thing I discovered. But then we've just gone on. I, I never was able to get into a developmental pediatrician. So it was this like wild goose chase of trying to figure out what else is wrong with her. And she did too. It's like she walked late. It was like 17 months. And people are like, yeah, that's late. But it's still within norms. That's late, yeah. Uh -huh. And I'm like, but like even when she walked, it's not coordinated. She's floppy. Like tummy time was a disaster. Like it just really so many signs. And I've always worked in severe needs programs before I worked in this. And I just always suspected cerebral palsy in her, right? 
Anyway, I can't get that diagnosis because they can't find a lesion on the MRI. But they so never can, or they often can't, I should say. Oh, they it makes me crazy. That was their reasoning. That was legit their reasoning. So that was what the neurologist wanted since it wasn't there. No CP. Well, okay. So I go along in my journey. I, you know, we acquire ADHD, SPD. Then we acquire dyspraxia from an OT, AKA developmental coordination disorder. Um, hypotonia was in there noted by OTs. Um, I stalked Dr. Steckel down in her uh, right. hotel room once when she was out here giving a talk on yeah. apraxia, begging her to just tell me if Ashlyn had this arthria and like graciously she let me into her hotel room <laughs> and it did like Ashlyn does, but it's so mild, right? Yeah. It's very mild. Yeah. And so anyways, I was glad to have that. I'm like, okay, but if she has this arthria, like this still brings me back to cerebral palsy. So my client that I was just talking about with cerebral palsy, his mom was like, have you been to a, it's either a physiatrist or physiatrist. A physiatrist. Mm -hmm. yes, yes, yes. Okay. So I was like, I've never even heard of this doctor. So she was like, oh, it's his doctor. I'll, I'll refer you. She's great. Blah, blah, blah. Anyways, Ashton goes in for this evaluation. And like, I saw it with my own eyes, this clonus test that they gave on her ankle. And it, she, her ankle just started beating like however they manipulated it until they made it stop. And she was like, even her, her resident was like, what am I looking at? And she was like, you know, she's a pro. Like she does this all the time. She's like, yep, that's a blah, it did it, it did it. Like she did, uh, and she identified like when Ashlyn was walking something called a pie pan hand. And like uh, this woman knew her stuff. You are never going to convince me my daughter doesn't have cerebral palsy. Last leg of my journey, we go in for a genetic. That lady sent me to genetics and was like, I think you should check this out. She, I find out she has that genetic mutation and the geneticist was like, well, and I was like, well, she has this because part of her genetic mutation does not include cerebral palsy. It does include de gross developmental coordination. And I was like, well, yeah. And then plus the cerebral palsy and she diagnosed her with dystonic cerebral palsy. And the geneticist was like, that's a trash can diagnosis. <laughs> so I now I've had, imagine if you're a parent, I'm a professional. You're not going to convince me. She doesn't have it. I always knew she had it. I worked in the field, but now I've had a neurologist tell me she didn't have it and a geneticist, like these poor parents and speech professionals even that are just trying to do the best for their patients. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Ashlyn does not have a diagnosis of CP? No, she does, dystonic oh. cerebral palsy. It's just that the geneticist said that's a trash can diagnosis. I'm like, well, whatever, what it's still mean? in her file, right? It means that they think that people diagnose cerebral palsy flippantly and that there are other things going on so it's just a trash can overarching thing to 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 describe other disorders which it's not true she has it she has a mixed tone representation of dystonic cerebral palsy 100 wow yeah it's hard what parents go through you know oh, it really is yeah um, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay dr levy we're gonna let you do treatment strategies now okay yeah. or activity because okay. this is what everybody wants and um we could talk to you for hours but we know your time is precious so go ahead and give us what you got all right so uh the bad news is we don't have randomized control trials actually we do have a small randomized control trial but um there are very few studies out there so i will talk about the studies that have evidence behind them um or at least the 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 three strategies that really have good um, evidence behind them. Again, not a, a big randomized control trial, but good research, which we really like. Um, so one of, uh, probably the, the best known research, uh, treatment research is by Lindsay Pennington, who's in England. Um, and she uses a subsystems approach uh, where, and, and so for, for all of these, I just suggest, unfortunately there aren't many trainings, but read articles by Lindsay Pennington. Okay. Um, and hers focuses on first um, breathing, phonation, and then putting it in words and sentences and so on. So working, you know, that the assumption there is that uh, all the subsystems or many of the subsystems are affected in, um, in dysarthria. And so you work on those subsystems. Um, so, and there's evidence that that works and she's even done uh, online treatment uh, so that's good these days, especially. Um, yeah, so that's sure. important. Um, no large randomized control trial, but nobody has, and her evidence is strong uh, within the small groups that she's able to test. The other one um, we were talking about, uh, Professor Ramig, who whom I've collaborated with. Um, so 
there's work in Lee Silverman voice treatment. So um, Fox and Bolek um, do the most work on children with dysarthria and using Lee Silverman voice treatment to improve speech. Um, so there's no big randomized control trial, except that for Parkinson's disease, actually I've done one with Lori Ramy where we had um, 57 people with Parkinson's disease. Um, so it works, we know for Parkinson's disease and the small studies by Fox and Bolek and Bolek and Fox um, are also showing some um, that it can be effective as well, you know, in increasing um, pr production, speak, good speech production um, and some intelligibility as well in children with dysarthria. So that's the second, and that one actually has training. So you can get trained in Lee Silverman voice stream and LSVT loud. It's mostly, it focuses mostly on adults, but there are also, I think, some programs on children. And once you know the treatment, you can kind of um, use it for children, but of course, think about the differences between adults and, and children. Sure. So we've talked about Lindsay Pennington's treatment and also um, Fox and Bullock, Lee Silverman voice treatment. Um, and those are the two other ones. And then there's my treatment, uh, which is called speech intelligibility treatment. And for that, I would suggest um, the information can be found in, there are two articles that are gonna come out, I think in July this summer in Journal of Speech Language Hearing Research. And there's some in the past as well, but um, 2021 uh, Journal of Yay. Speech Language Hearing Research. There are going to be two, and the the there's one on English and there's one on French, um, and the English one I'm first author on that, um, so it'll be Levy et al. in 2021. Um, that one has the protocol of speech intelligibility treatment in it, so awesome. clinicians can go there, and there's also a link to a video about our speech treatment, um, and it has also good re results. So we're reporting on six years of the treatment. Wow. Um, that's how long it takes to get enough participants. Um, so, and it shows wow. that their intelligibility increased as measured by um, listener ratings. Um, we also look at production and, and so on. And also in that um, same issue is the French randomized control trial. It's very small, but as far as I know, it's the first randomized control trial to do um, a comparator treatment. Uh, so one speech, one non-speech treatment. So we had, we went to Belgium um, and had worked with my colleague, um, a, a group by my, connected to my colleague, Andrew Gordon here in at Teachers College in Belgium though. Um, and we treated children with CP over two years in French, French speaking children. And we randomized them either to a speech group or to um, a physical therapy group is what we called it. Um, it's called Habitil or, um, and it has to do with movement. Okay. Um, so they move, worked a lot on, on movement. And listeners heard both kids pre and post treatment, both groups of kids pre and post treatment and the kids with who got speech intelligibility treatment improved whereas the children with, and that's intelligibility I, that was measured I believe by um, the gold standard intelligibility measures measure, which is percent words correct, that is transcription accuracy. Um, whereas the children who um, got the physical therapy treatment did not get better. So that is, um, you know, very small study, but um, good real evidence-based research. Um, so there are two studies in the that issue, the July issue of general speech language hearing research. And so to learn about how to use that treatment, you know, I hope that I'm able to do trainings. Um, I do trainings for my students. I have to maybe think about how to do training <laughs> for the public, uh, but the protocol at least is there and there's a link to video. So hopefully that will be there, but it's all about using your big mouth and your strong voice to help pe have people understand you better. Um, there is a link um, that, that um, I think if you if you Google CP Speech Camp, uh, Levy Speech, CP Speech Camp, or Teachers College, you'll find um, a video about the camp, and you'll see kind of how it works. Um, but we focus on big mouth and strong voice, and we use um, games because it's for kids. You know, make sure they have fun. Uh, that and these games all are about are all about um, enhancing intelligibility. So one of the my favorite games to use is uh, headbands where yeah. for example, I'm wearing a headband and it says egg and the person has to describe it. 
what it is. For me to be able to play this game successfully, I need to understand what they're saying. Um, and so that's, it's kind of, it's a sort of barrier task as we call it. Um, those kinds of games are really focused on intelligibility. You have to be able to understand in order to, um, to succeed. And we also have, um, we do minimal pairs or contrastive words where they have to um, somehow where we embed words like ship and sheep to try to expand that vowel space because in um, children with dysarthria, work by Hustad and Allison and a lot of other people. Um, Ray Kent has also done a lot of research on dysarthria um, and acoustic characteristics. We know that vowel space is contracted. It's not, it's, it's not big. And so for example, even in healthy typical people, those who speak with vowels farther apart in acoustic space are much more intelligible than those who, who don't move their tongues around as much and therefore their vowels are closer. So um, in dysarthria, children really don't move their articulators much. And so that's that was the reasoning behind big mouth that we try to um, make their mouths bigger, meaning their vowel space bigger, vowels further apart from each other, their I further from their E and their vowel space bigger so that they're easier to understand. So um, activities that really focus on vowel distinction of distinctiveness, contrastive words like ship and sheep, um, those are really good activities to use. And of course, for everything, no matter what treatment you use, and all three of these treatments that I've mentioned use this, you have to use motor learning principles because doing things once and having a nice relaxing time and fun, <laughs> right? not gonna happen. You gotta do it over and over and over and over. Repetition is really key. And my graduate students and these, um, my, these master's students, doctoral students are amazing at making activities fun for kids. And that's key. You want them to come back, not just for you, but for the next clinician as well. Absolutely. Yeah, I was just thinking using that lion when you're talking about using, you know, the big lion and the little lion and then attaching those specific verbal cues to it. Um, I have it written down, but whatever your verbal cues are for the big, big mouth, mouth. Strong voice, yeah. Those are, those are exactly principles of motor learning that we use to help, um, you know, in that case with planning, planning and programming where this is more execution. But it's yeah. interesting that those same principles are applied, but, and they're applied, but they work for a different reason. They're working for the execution piece of it, yeah. but it's still yeah. amazing. It's yeah. fascinating. It's fascinating. Yeah. And, and, the, and when you talk about vowels, you know, we always talk about how vowels really carry intelligibility. Vowels shape the oral cavity. And so if your vowel, if your speech is mumbled or garbled or, you know, slurred in any way, the problem is really with those vowels not being big and, and open. So I just, uh -oh. there she is. Oh, sorry. Did I cut hey. out? Am, am I back? Yeah, but you're back. Oh, okay. But yeah, just that those vowels, um, uh, you know, when you mumble or when speech is mumbled or garbled or slurred or whatever you want to call it, um, is that the vowels are not big, right? Because they're, they're not shaping the oral cavity. And so with apraxia, we work on getting those vowels. So many of our young children, they just have the neutral vowels, uh, 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 you know, and just trying to get more vowels, but we also want them to be big and we want them to be able to, um, you know, carry some of that intelligibility. So yeah. fascinating. And to me, that's also what's very interesting. One thing that's very interesting across languages. So oh. for example, oh, we yeah. have Spanish speakers, and there are many in the United States yeah. in dysarthria, there are only five vowels. So does right. that mean that it's less important to keep those vowels far apart because there are just five of them than in English where we have a lot more vowels? So we don't know. We're just beginning to look at this. No, oh, that's incredible. Just fascinating. I'm in awe. I don't know. This is bad. Me too. This, this is, is so awesome. I, the other I thing I, I wanted to point out that I didn't hear you say involved in the treatment is non-speech oral motor exercises. So d does that have a place in the treatment of dysarthria? Because certainly when we talk about strength, that people are automatically saying, oh, well, we have to, uh, you know, since dysarthria is weakness, we need to strengthen the articulators. What are your thoughts on that? There is no place for non-speech <laughs> oral exercises in dysarthria treatment. So okay. there is no research that has shown that it's effective. Um, I don't want to get so much into the details of that. Uh, I would yeah. refer the listener to, uh, or the watcher, the observer, <laughs> to Loth and Watson um, and all of their research. But uh, one thing I can say is that we really have to think about task specificity and the fact that you know, we're trying to get people to do this very complex communicative art, which is speech. And so taking a component of it and strengthening um, one 
articulator is not going to cut it. Um, and we also know that some people who have um, dysarthria don't have dysphagia, for example, and vice versa. So it's really mm. about the um, task specificity. So same neural underpinnings uh, can have different results and really task specificity, focusing on the task of speaking is very important. So, so if you I get better at speaking, then you practice speaking, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. That's the best way. And so, you know, it also relates to what we were talking about, about, you know, kids with dysarthria may never sound um, completely uh, typical, mm -hmm. but we want them to speak and communicate in some way. So we're not going for the same musculature. We're not going even necessarily for the same um, way to produce a sound. Um, right. So for example, I can think of, you know, there's, there's Mobius syndrome, uh, where I don't know if you're familiar with this, but the seventh nerve is affected often. And, well, and there's, there's sometimes cleft palate or palatal abnormalities. And, you know, I can think of certain people with, um, with this syndrome who, instead of producing, or I actually worked with a child who, instead of producing a ba because she couldn't put her lips together, she produced a da, and she would say daddy instead of baby. Mm -hmm. I see that we use lot. what we have. It will probably not work to strengthen her articulators, but it might work to find some compensation, um, some other way to get that communication across. Yeah, compensatory strategies is something I really learned about from David Hammer, actually, when I did my apraxia training, and he was talking about dysarthria and apraxia coexisting, and he was saying that there are times in a child with dysarthria, we might have to teach them an acoustically or accept an acoustically correct production of some sort of consonant if they have dysarthria for the sake of moving this child along, and again, the goal being making them more intelligible. So, um, Fortunately for me, I went through that training right when Ashlyn was little and she did have this very low tone face and floppy tongue and, and her tongue is just, I can't even do it. It's just flat and floppy. And so yeah. we could acoustically get, you know, um, like if I was going to say two, like two, it sounds yeah. acoustically correct. And for the sake of moving her along, yeah, yeah, exactly. For the sake of moving her along, we accepted that compensatory placement, you know, on the medial part of the tongue for now, um, for those alveolars. And now we've been able yeah. to refine it, you know, later on. And now we're kind of refining things as she's older. But I'm really thankful that I did that and didn't get too stuck on the fact like, oh, no, we need your tongue nice and tense behind your teeth before we move on. Or, you know, she can do another thing, too, in a retracted lip state. She can say P's and B's. And I have another client like this too, and when they're with dysarthria, and when they're talking really fast, they start using that compensatory placement. And it sounds so close to being acoustically correct. I have to be looking at them and I see therapists get caught up on, oh, we need to make sure no matter what these lips are closed. And it's like, okay, at some point, I just need her to be able to speak to me and we can work on refining those later. I agree. That's just my opinion. Yeah. I agree. And I think that the overall goal at first is to really get people as intelligible as they can get. Then you can work on the details a little bit more later. But first, well, first we said communication, right. then really intelligibility. And related to that, I wanted to add that I think one, um, when you were talking about all the different things that you could be working on, we don't want to work on too many things at the same time. And I'm glad that didn't happen with your daughter. Because yeah. We, we can't do that. I can't process, you know, a million things, you know, take a deep breath, do this, do that, do that. Really give me one or two commands and I can do it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something I think to think about, about, you know, some of the children we work with have cognitive limitations, but mm -hmm. they're all just children. Um, and even with adults, it's very hard to multitask. And yeah. so yeah. what what's the what what's going to give you the most, bang for the buck, basically. Um, and so, you know, choose those carefully and repeat, 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 use your motor learning principles and then move on to the next. Which is why big mouth, strong voice makes so much sense because for young children, I can even think about some of my three-year-olds that I work with who could really understand the, the visual with the lion, you know, the big mouth and the strong voice that gives them two things to focus on. I think we can, we can coach caregivers, teachers, parents, nannies, you know, grandparents yeah. Yeah. on that very simplified, but so, you know, very important, um, two strategies that will, like you said, give us the biggest bang for our buck and really help increase intelligibility overall. 
So yeah, exciting. I think so. And then also Lee Silverman voice treatment um, is another one. And that's, you know, I'm inspired by that where there's that the one, the one command speak loud. And that has, it's not just about speaking loud when you speak loud or when you speak with a strong voice, um, there are all sorts of acoustic changes that happen. Your, your intonation gets better. Mm -hmm. um, your face <laughs> lights up a lot changes. Um, your articulation also gets better. Your speech gets slower. Um, so there's, and we've shown with LSVT that you know, people become more intelligible. So I think there are various, there are many options, or at least there are three options that we know <laughs> have in space um, for dysarthria. Um, as long as you're doing those with evidence and you're following motor learning principles, probably, maybe, hopefully you're making progress. This has been wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thank so you much. so much. I, this is just a great way to uh, spend an hour of our time. Laura, thank you for suggesting this and for putting this together. I'm, I'm, I'm tickled. So thank, thank you, you so Carrie. much for joining thank you, us. Laura. My yeah. Pleasure. Oh, I really appreciate it. And, you know, I always, I'm just in so much gratitude all the time when someone's willing to take time out of their day to do this because we don't have anything to offer you. I have no pay to give you. <laughs> um, it really is just, uh, we're all passionate about the areas that we're working in you as well. And, you know, your passion being across languages too is, is Fascinating. incredible. So this July of so 2021, much. right? That's yes. when we research. Yeah. So we, hopefully we'll all help children become more intelligent. Uh, so, so across wonderful. Across <laughs> wonderful. Languages. Fabulous. Well, we have followers in many countries around the world, don't we, Laura? So when yeah. you post this and it will make people happy all over the world. So thank you so much for your time. We appreciate thank it. Thank you so much. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.